Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is the good stuff. This is the AAS Journal Author Series. And I'm very happy to have Matthew Renzo with us today. Hey, Matthew. Hi, everyone. Hi, Frank. Uh, let's see. What's your geolocation? I am in New York City in Manhattan in my office. Ooh, OK. Uh, so you're at Flatiron, is that right? Yes, I am at Flatiron at CCA, Center for Computational Astrophysics. Okay. Great place to be. Yeah. So are most people, are a lot of people coming into the office there? Or? It's been fluctuating a bit. And now, you know, it's December, closer to the holidays. So it's it's in a down. Uh, but it, it's definitely more interactions than being uh, in my room, in my tiny New York apartment. <laughs> so... <laughs> It's definitely for me. It's definitely worth coming, and uh, it's very flexible. Uh, I, I, everyone is free to decide whatever feels better to them. Very good. Very good. So I imagine uh, has it snowed yet, in New York, or is it? Uh... It did snow once, but uh, it didn't hold, and it's been a pretty mild start of the winter so far. Okay. Barely went below zero. Celsius, sorry, I have no idea. Yeah, so Celsius is fine, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a polygot on temperature scales. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a mild winter here in Phoenix, but I think all winters are mild in Phoenix. Uh, sometimes we get around freezing, um, but not too much below. So it's all good. That's great. So Matthew, what do you like to do for research? So I usually work on massive stars because I like things that explode. And in particular, that means working on binaries because most of them are in binaries. And I'm particularly interested in the relationship between the evolution of the stars and what that means for the explosions and vice versa, how the explosions then impact the binaries. So runaway stars, uh, hypervelocity stars, things like that. Cool. Uh, yeah, and of course, massive stars nowadays also almost naturally means gravitational wave progenitors. Indeed, which will bring us to this really lovely, very nice APJ letter. The yeah. stellar merger scenarios, scenario for black holes in the pair instability gap. And Matthew, take us away. Yes, so this was a paper uh, where we tried to address some of the difficulties of this stellar merger scenario that has been proposed to explain some very massive black holes that should not exist according to canonical stellar evolution. In particular, we expect that very massive stars that are radiation pressure dominated will encounter the pair instability and have done some work on that in the past. And that should set a maximum black hole mass of about 45 to 50 solar masses. And now uh, LIGO has announced well, this event, GW190521, which has both black hole masses in uh, these pair instability gaps so above these 50 solar mass threshold that we would expect from standard stellar evolution. And actually, since uh, this paper came out, LIGO has put out the, gravitation, the second gravitational wave catalog, where they estimated that about 3% of uh, astrophysical black holes with large error bars uh, have masses that require some explanation that bypasses this pair instability gap. And one such explanation that has been proposed in the literature and the LIGO, uh, the LIGO collaboration picked up was this stellar merger scenario, which relies on making mergers in dense stellar environments, such as a cluster or a nuclear star cluster, to create a weird star that has a core that is small enough that it doesn't hit the pair instability but an oversized envelope for that core that provides a lot of mass that could then form a, a black hole that is not supposed to exist from normal stellar evolution. Okay. And this scenario, it's, it's very interesting, but very speculative. There are like uh, several points 
that are that require a little bit more of attention right. and we did not try to address all of them we tried to address one and found that maybe that particular point that that we tried to investigate is not the weakest spot of of this scenario and it it's not a no go for this scenario okay. so maybe let me walk you through uh what are these challenges and that's like if you go a bit further down in the paper yeah there it is the first challenge is already there on the first page is this scenario assumes that you have a merger in a cluster between two stars now uh this means that you have two things that you have to do you have to keep your mass during the merger and you have to avoid that this merger process makes your core grow because if your helium core grows then the scenario doesn't work anymore you hit the pairing stability regime again and your star will not make a big black hole and this is something we did not investigate in this paper we do not make a real simulation of the merger process okay but from what's out in the literature one could expect that a merger process with a direct impact like a head on collision between stars should remove about 5 to 10% of its mass yeah. and most of these simulations are sph simulations that do not include the effects of radiation so for very massive stars here we are at the edge uh, of the pairing stability gap radiation effects can be very important and right. we might expect that if anything you will have a little bit more mass loss mm -hmm. um but again here we we did not try to investigate these in too much depth and we just are going to assume that no mass is lost like in the canonical scenario uh, that has been proposed the second uh challenge yeah this is section 2.2 is okay let's assume that this merger works as we expect by not modifying the core okay and then we have a star with a small core and a big envelope mm -hmm. and can this star hold on to its mass and these uh there there are several aspects here that can be problematic the first one is well massive stars are very large line driven winds that want to remove a lot of mass now if you go at, at a low enough metallicity you can prevent wind mass loss because winds scale roughly with the square root of metallicity and and so you can uh, dump the winds like this but of course if it's a merger product it might be rotating fast there's some debate in the literature a rotation can enhance your winds and go in the opposite direction and also something that i didn't mention but rotation is also a problem for the core because rotational mixing can again lead to core mm -hmm. growth mm -hmm. uh, so but here we're assuming that everything will be non-rotating because this scenario comes from population synthesis where rotation is not really treated yeah and then going back to the problem of the star holding onto its mass well these these merger products might be helium rich and they've been for a long time proposed as typical progenitors of luminous blue variables so luminous blue variables are these very massive stars exactly that uh, experience outbursts of mass loss which are poorly understood from a theoretical point of view but people suggested uh, that helium richness might enhance this phenomenon and if you have a merger and you you might be helium rich and i'll get into more into that in a second then the third and the fourth scenario are the uh, again things that we did not investigate in too much detail what happens at core collapse does the star swallow all this hydrogen that it still had which is necessary to make your black hole in the pairing stability gap, mm -hmm. or are there mass loss processes at black hole formation due to the neutrino emission, due to maybe jets if the star was rotating or uh, other. Uh, this is something where more work uh, will be needed. And finally, all of these scenario, like so far I've talked about two stars that merged in a cluster and they merged as stars 
So at best, you make one black hole in the gap. So to explain GW19 of 521, we need this to happen twice, and the two black holes need to find each other. Now, this, the fourth scenario, is actually what has been worked out already in the literature. And since if you allow your system, your cluster, to make very massive black holes, these will tend to sink to the core and very easily find other massive black holes with which they can merge within the age of the universe. So maybe this last point is not the main challenge and people have shown already that this can work. And actually this, if this scenario works, it's pretty fast in creating gravitational wave sources. The delay time between the star burst, the formation of the stars in your cluster and the final gravitational wave merger is of order of tens of mega years, which is extremely fast for gravitational wave sources. Yep. So we wanted to, in particular, investigate the evolution of these merger products and, and address what I framed as the second challenge here. And to do this, we assume that the merger works uh, exactly as we expected uh, or as we uh, posit, that is, no modification to the core, and we neglect rotation. And we took two stars, two massive stars uh, of masses that are typical for this scenario, which means 58 solar masses for star one and 42 for star two, <clears throat> and we merged them. Now, in, in this figure, this shows the composition, the chemical composition as a function of mass. In particular, the purple lines are hydrogen, and the um, uh, green lines are helium. And these are at the time of the merger, which we assume is at the end of the main sequence of star one. So star one has a well-defined helium core, which is marked by the thick lines in the top panel. And by the time star one, as it, it's done with its main sequence, Star two was also a massive star. So their lifetime are not very different. And as you can see, star two has like 75% of its core made of helium. And so it's also very advanced in its main sequence. Yep. And if you don't want to put that helium in the core, which is what one might expect for a merger simulation where you do some entropy sorting, that is not what this scenario posits. So if you don't put the helium in the core, well, you have to put it somewhere. And here we make uh, two limiting cases. One is let's mix completely star two in the envelope of our merger. And these are the solid lines in the bottom panel. So the yeah. bottom panel, the solid lines show the core, which is exactly the same as the core of star one by hypothesis. Yep. And then the envelope, turns out to be helium rich because we have mixed all the helium of star two in the envelope. Yep. And as the opposite limiting case, we say, well, let's forget about the evolution of star two. And let's say that star one merges with a star two that is just born and it has its primordial composition. Yep. Now, this is extremely fine tuned uh, because, well, you need a non-star burst star formation, and you need basically as soon as star two is formed, it merges with an evolved star, which is might, might not be what, what is typically expected, but it brackets right. the possibilities. So that's why we, we went there. Okay. And once we have like our merger structure in that is shown here in the bottom panel, we can let it go uh, in, in MESA in their stellar evolution codes and see what happens. And the next figure, I think it's going to show the HR diagram that we found. It's in the next page, I think. There it is. Yeah, so let's look at figure two and the left panel uh, to begin with. So the blue and the red curves are now the HR diagram evolution, so luminosity and temperature on a reversed axis. Uh, of our merger products. The blue is the one where we fully mixed the secondary star in the envelope. Okay. So it's, it's helium rich and that makes it bright. 
the red one is the one where we neglected the evolution of the secondary, so it's not as helium rich, and that's why it's slightly lower luminosity. And here, each dot is separated by about 500 years. Now, these merger stars already have a helium core and they're very massive, so they don't have very long to live. But you can see that most of the evolution is spent uh, on the hot side of the HR diagram, and a significant chunk is in this gray region, where, which is labeled as, as Dorados. Mm -hmm. That is an observational part of the HR diagram where we find luminous blue variables. So already there, observed stars don't like to be in hydrostatic equilibrium. And then later on, these stars cross this dotted diagonal line marked as HD limit, that's the Humphrey Davidson limit, yep. which is another observational thing on the HR diagram where we don't expect any star right uh, of these lines. Now, both the S. Doradus instability strip and the Humphrey Davidson limit have been determined in the local universe at metallicities that are galactic or the Magellanic clouds. But there are hints that these things might be metallicity independent, both from observations. For example, we know of luminous blue variables even in the small Magellanic cloud. Okay. And from theory, if indeed luminous blue variable eruptions are related to the helium uh, content, then metallicity doesn't matter. It's just the helium content that matters. We right. don't know that for a fact, but that made us think that it was worth plotting these things on this diagram together with our models. Yep. And as you can see, the very end of the evolution, it's very noisy, like the stars jump in luminosity and they're quite crazy. Uh, that is because the stars become unstable and this numerical instability might be related to the physical instabilities that trigger these luminous blue variable eruptions. In particular, you can see in figure three, just below, that shows the luminosity divided the Eddington luminosity. And once a star reaches the Eddington luminosity, there is like radiation pressure will prevent hydrostatic equilibrium. And so the star should be unstable. And as you can see, these stars, as a function of time, they evolve a very high um, Eddington ratios, very high luminosity divided Eddington luminosity. And there are four curves here because there are, uh, well, we have two stellar models and we have two different ways of calculating the Eddington luminosity. Uh -huh. The dashed curves here only consider the electron scattering opacity, which yeah. is a lower limit on the opacity, and so an upper limit on the Eddington luminosity, and therefore it gives the minimum ratio that we can have. While the solid lines, they consider the actual mean opacity at the stellar surface, the Russell and mean opacity within a tiny mass range at the surface of the star. Yep. And it could be, uh, it's unclear from the theory side, and this is difficult to get observationally, but it, it could be that luminous blue variable eruptions already happen with high uh, Eddington ratio that don't even need to cross one necessarily. Could okay. be a local phenomenon rather than, than something that really uh, necessitates uh, luminosities above Eddington. So okay. we think that this is what drives the noisiness in our HR diagram. Okay. And so the if you go back to the HR diagram for a, a second, um, the dashed curves, I, um, those are just single st normal single stars uh, okay. for comparison. I want to emphasize one thing, like the in the 140 solar mass star, one can clearly see the end of the main sequence, while in the 100 solar mass star, you don't see it. It's off the plot, which is weird. This is because those stars have different overshooting. The 100 solar mass star is the same overshooting as we used for these models, which is observationally informed from fitting the main sequence in the large Magellanic clouds. Okay. 
the 140 comes from another paper where we were interested in pulsational operating stability, and it has a smaller overshooting, hence a shorter main sequence. That, mm -hmm. that is the explanation for this thing that might confuse some experts. And indeed, on the right uh, panels, those show the internal evolution of these merger models. And uh, the, the, the top one shows the effective temperature versus density at the center of the, sorry, not the effective temperature, yeah, the course. central temperature versus the central density. And as you can see that the colored track, the blue and the red, they avoid this gray region, which is the pairing stability region. So in that sense, this scenario is working. We were able to artificially build a star that avoids the pairing stability. Um, while the 140, which comes from another paper, it's going up and down because it's reaching this pairing stability, although it's reaching it off center. So you see that the center is moving and, and doing crazy things, but it's the center itself is not in the gray region, which is something that we find happens in some pulsational pairing stability models. Right. So, so far, the scenario seems to work, but it seems to lead to stars that hit instabilities in the envelope, which might be related to the luminous blue variable uh, phenomenon. Okay. And if you go to figure five, uh, which is further down, we try to estimate what would be the amount of mass loss due to the, these luminous blue variable eruptions. This is something we cannot do fully self-consistently because we don't have a theory for luminous blue variable eruptions. We have many hypotheses, but none of them are really non-controversial. And so what we did is just uh, do an energetic estimate. So a bit further up, actually, there is the formula that we used to estimate the mass loss rate, which is just the or maybe it's further down, actually. Sorry, it's further down. I'm used okay. to the archive version. Oh, there we go. Right here. And it, it, there it is. Yes, perfect. So yeah, we can estimate the, the mass loss rate as the excess luminosity over the Eddington luminosity divided the escape velocity from the star that mm -hmm. has the dimension of a mass loss rate. And it's basically assuming that all the photons that you have uh, above the adding the limit are all 100% used to lift material just from the surface of the star. So it's a very crude estimate. And since we just apply it in post-processing to our model, yep. we neglect any stellar reaction. As you remove mass, the radius can change, the escape velocity can change. So this is a very crude estimate. But if you do these estimates, you get in the bottom panel of figure five, this, this green line, which is oscillating a bit because the luminosity of the star is oscillating and it's noisy. Yep. And in the top panel, we're showing the cumulative mass loss uh, from all the processes. So the, the line driven winds, which is the blue one and it's acting earlier on yep. and then it saturates and then later in the evolution we hit these instabilities and we get this Eddington mass loss rate and the total amount of mass that is removed is only of order of one solar mass mm -hmm. so given the error bars that LIGO is giving on individual black hole masses this is not something we have to worry too much about with all the caveats that this is a rough estimate that neglects the reaction uh, of the star to the mass loss. But one thing to keep in mind is that all this paper is computed at a metallicity of two times 10 to the minus four, okay. which is roughly a hundredth of the solar metallicity, which is good for uh, gravitational wave progenitors. But if you increase the metallicity, the opacity of your star goes up by a lot. Yep. So you're adding to luminosity goes down for a given mass, and that will increase the amount of energy that you have to drive 
these mass loss episodes. So one conclusion that we can draw from this is we it, this might work at very low metallicity, but there will be some metallicity threshold above which you will lose all the mass that you want to have in your final black hole. And so to summarize basically this, uh, of these four challenges, the what happens during the merger, what happens during the evolution, what happens at black hole formation, and how do you pair the black holes? Well, two of them might not be no-goes. We are able to, if these black holes exist, we are able to pair them through clusters and get gravitational wave sources. And if the merger process works as we, uh, as this scenario posits, then maybe it is possible at sufficiently low metallicity to keep the mass on the star as it evolves. Okay. Cool. Yes. Very nice. Very nice. So you hit on it a couple of times uh, as you went through this this letter, uh, but sort of where does where does the community go over the next uh, four years? Of course, there's going to be a lot of action in this because you know black holes and the mass gap are a hot topic right now with LIGO. Um, lots of people working on it. So if you look in your crystal ball, um, what do you see coming up on the horizon uh, over the next let's say couple of years? Um, you don't have to spill your next research project. You can if you want. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I guess there are two things. For this particular scenario that has gained some popularity despite the many uh, weak points or, or things that require more attention, I don't think we, we have completely demonstrated that this scenario can work. Mm -hmm. uh, and in particular, it would be very interesting to see simulations of the merger process at this mass regime which might completely change the initial conditions for the experiment that, that I've just described. And the other thing is investigate the mass loss at black hole formation, which is something that we've started working on. Uh, those two things are related to this scenario specifically, but this is not the only idea that has been floated around to explain black holes in the pairing stability mass gap. There are many very interesting ideas, and I think uh, many of them require uh, working them out in, in more detail to see what can work and what doesn't work. Like evolution in AGN disks is a very promising uh, thing, both because the stars might evolve differently, but also because the disk and the gas of the AGN disk might drive mergers slightly different than, than in vacuum, and that could lead to black holes in the gap uh, and body dynamics. Uh, so there, there is like, a, right now there are more scenarios to explain these black holes than black holes in the <laughs> gap, That's right. which is like, there are many things that, that needs to be uh, either killed as a scenario or, or confirmed. And it's a, it's a booming field, uh, very interesting. So let me take a slightly different route. Um, you know, there, there has been some literature recently that would question whether those black holes are actually even there in the mass gap, that they've been misidentified somehow, or that the, the template that is being used for the extraction of the masses um, is biased in some way. Yeah, that's very true. There have been like, two different kinds of, of ways to get rid of these uncomfortably massive black holes. One is to change your priors and right. say, I, I do believe in the results of stellar evolution. And people have shown that for that particular event, this could solve the problem in a very interesting way, it could make these two black holes, one just below the gap and one just above the gap, which would be very cool. Or the other thing is in the in the sampling of the parameter space for LIGO. And now, like these uh, proposals have been put out for that particular event, GW 190521. Mm -hmm. But now that LIGO has put out the catalog, this is something I am not an expert on, but I would like to know the answer is are these explanations that avoid the black hole still working if you have a population 
of 3% of all black holes being in the gap, mm -hmm. which is a question I don't know the answer to, and I would be very eager to, to read about. So that's another direction, definitely, that, that the community should take. Very cool. Yep, there is, uh, I will predict lots of action in this field yeah. over five years, and you've laid out a couple of really cool pathways to investigate. So. Yeah, and it's surprising that we went from not believing in 30 solar mass black holes as a community, and now we have to deal with uh, 85 solar mass black holes yep. uh, just five years after. So it's very exciting. Yep, indeed. Very cool. Matthew, I want to thank you so much for sharing your lovely paper with us and walking right, us thank through Thank you it. for having me. All right, everyone. Thank you so much, and we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.